All right. It's just about time to get started here. Hello, everyone. Um, welcome to our monthly Intelligence for Admins webinar. I'm Derek. I lead our customer education efforts here at Trackvia. Today, we've got uh, one of our awesome implementation engineers, Tim Coletti, on the line with us. If you want to say hello to everyone, Tim. Hey, everyone. And uh, we are going to be talking about uh, a pretty cool topic today, um, Gantt charts, and specifically how to automate them. Um, so if any of you have worked with our implementation engineers in the past, they're always cooking up awesome, powerful new functionality to help our customers. And uh, this is one of those things, um, being able to create dependencies between tasks on a Gantt chart. Um, so we'll dig into what that means here in just a minute. Um, but let's go ahead and look at some housekeeping items. Um, everyone that's joining today is in listen-only mode, so please submit your questions via the chat and question feature of GoToWebinar. Okay, we'll see the questions as they're coming in. We'll try to answer them in real time. Any that we don't get to, we've got a section at the end for questions as well. Um, but please send anything through, any questions, fair game. And then um, after the webinar, we will, of course, uh, record this and post it on the Track via University website, just like all the webinars that we run. And you'll be able to uh, look at it there, but we'll also send it to you in an email, okay? Um, all right, let's look at the agenda. So um, if, uh, if you've joined one of these webinars in the past, you may recall that there are short surveys at the end uh, where we ask your thoughts and your feedback. And, um, one of the things that we wanted to try out, some feedback that we've had on recent webinars, is that we want to jump quickly, uh, or we'll try jumping quickly into the demo, try to get to that part of the webinar faster, right? Um, so we're going to give that a go today. Um, we're, but of course, we're going to want to set the scene a little bit. We'll talk briefly about uh, project management within Trackvia, about what a Gantt chart is, and then Tim is going to dive right into a demo of how to create uh, automated or Gantt charts that have dependencies. Okay, we'll come back together after the demo. We'll talk about questions. We'll uh, talk about some uh, key takeaways. And then, of course, we'll just wrap things up. So uh, let's dive in and talk about uh, project management. So Tim, uh, if you could just share, uh, share with everybody today uh, just a little bit about project management, your experience with project management apps, um, why you think TrackV is particularly well suited uh, for project management apps. Yep. Yes, so I've worked on a fair number of project management apps, both before my time at Trackvia and here. Um, I've built a, a fair number of them as an implementation engineer. Uh, the, the real trick to it, and I think the thing that makes Trackvia good at it, is that a lot of times you have a lot of users who should be able to see all the tasks, but on their day-to-day, -day, it can be kind of overwhelming to see everything that's happening across the whole project. And one of the you know, most important things is being able to split up your tasks so that everybody just sees the stuff that they work on or just sees the stuff that they oversee. You, know, you have these um, you know, different, different kind of sub, subsets of interest across your organization. And uh, you know, being able to take the same table of tasks and slice it up 100 different ways for 100 different stakeholders, uh, it's, it's a huge deal. Uh, and being able to take the same data and show it on different kinds of calendars that are grouped and sorted in different ways it's that's the key that's basically the secret yeah yeah i agree and i think probably one of my favorite things about track via as well um and i think we actually did a webinar we did a webinar about this a couple of months ago uh dynamic filtering be able to change what people see when they're logged into the system you know for example if you have uh, you know if you're using track via for a healthcare uh type application maybe you have different providers that need to see different patients or you have you know a manufacturing application built within track and you have different facilities that need to see different things anytime you need people to see different things track is really really good at that and of course that lends itself to project management as well yeah i agree um so then within project management applications a lot of the ones that you've seen uh built or you have built tim um i think gantt charts are pretty common so um i've got on the screen here an example of a gantt chart can you just tell us a little bit about what a gantt chart is what the value of it is 
Yeah, so the Gantt chart is a, a, a scheduling tool for, uh, for project management. Uh, what it does is it shows you all the tasks with their beginning and their end dates, so you can see them all at once. So a lot of times if you're looking at just a calendar or just a list, it's easy to lose a, a lot of the, the, the ways things line up and uh, it, it's, it's especially useful if you have tasks that depend on each other. If you know that you know, task seven can't start until task two is finished, when you, you know, look at a list, you want to be able to tell that right away and see if that's still on track or you know, is task two getting delayed or is something else coming in that's going to matter. Uh, the, the Gantt chart gives you this really nice way to just glance down the list, see what it is, and, uh, and, and get a really good picture right away of what's going on with the project without having to wade through quite so many details. Yeah, and I, I love the fact that you can see, you know, a lot of times you can see the project, the timeline for the whole project. You can, but at the same time, you can see the timeline for each of the tasks or events within the project relative to each other, right? I think it's it's a, just a quick and easy way to visual, visualize what's happening with the project. Um, so if that's, you know, what a, a Gantt chart does, you know, that's the value it provides to him. What, and today we're talking about creating dependencies in Gantt charts. What does that mean exactly? Yeah, so with um, you know with a regular Gantt chart, if you like I said before, if you have a, a task that's depending on another one, suppose task two gets delayed, the person looking at the Gantt chart has to know, ah, well that means that task seven isn't going to start right away. Uh, but there's some other there's some other tasks that will be waiting on task seven, and they're not going to start right away. Now I have to go down with each of those tasks and update their dates and leave comments so that everybody knows what happened. With automation, uh, we can make it so that those tasks will drift by themselves, so that their estimated timeline will push on its own. So if, task, if somebody goes into task two and says, we finished this a week late, then task seven and anything dependent on task seven is going to slide right along with it. Yeah, awesome. So like an example might be if you're building a, a house, right? Um, you Let's say task one is you know digging the foundation. And I don't know a ton about building houses here, but I would imagine in most cases you need to have the foundation squared away before you can work on framing, right? So if the foundation gets delayed, you want to make sure framing also is pushed out and everything that you know is dependent on that, right? Um, cool. So uh, by you know by default in Track Via, our Gantt charts don't have um, you, really that ability to do those dependencies, but um, like I said before, the implementation engineers are wizards and they come up with really great stuff. Um, so Tim, why don't you show us how you might in Trackvia um, go ahead and create you know, dependencies between tasks so you do get some of that uh, functionality. So let's jump into your Trackvia account and check it out. All right. I'll stop sharing here. All right, can you see it? Yes, we can. All right, so I've set some examples here. Uh, all three of these views go to the same table. They're all looking at the same task just to show different ways that you can display this. Um, the, the best three ways are the, the, Gantt, the true Gantt chart, which is a, a chart type in the, uh, in, a, in the view builder, you go to the, the chart type. And in the timeline and calendar, these are a sort of specialized view that you can do from the, uh, from the hamburger menu on the side. Um, the timeline and the Gantt chart are very similar. The, the main difference is you can group them in slightly different ways. You can also make it so that uh, on a timeline you can move between your weeks and your months. You, you, you know, slightly more options. I prefer the timeline to the Gantt, but they're very similar and you may find uses for either one. And then obviously the calendar itself does the same thing, but stretched across calendar. Um, but what we've got here is you have a lot of tasks. If you if you were the project manager, you'd be looking at this, you'd see all these tasks across three different projects that I've set up here. And you can see how they intersect and overlap. And if they depended on each other, you'd have to hunt through that a little bit or click down into them and see what people have commented. Um, but just to give an example, we've got foundation walls and roof down here in Project X. And uh, in this case, you know, the walls can't go until after the foundation, but the foundation has been delayed. So now the walls are early. So the, what we would normally have to do is open up that walls task and manually change its estimated start date so that it starts when we know that the foundation will be done. Uh, but what I've done instead on this app is uh, I've, I've set up a little bit of uh, automation in here. So we have, if I go into those walls, I can tell it that it depends on foundation. So I'm going to go into the walls task, and I have a, a little multi-select up here. And I'm going to pick foundation on the multi-select, and that'll, that'll mean that once I save it, it knows that it depends on that. 
So if we head back out to the view, you see that walls has now glued itself to the end of foundation to the extent that if I go into foundation and say, oh, this is, this is going to take five days instead and save it, that the walls have gone with it. And I can do the same thing if I go into roof and say that roof depends on walls. Same thing. All just stretched out. So that way, if, if anything happens with those, um, we can use that to generate notifications. We can use that to have an update on somebody's somebody's queue. If your users all have a dashboard that shows them what they need, you, you got that. Uh, I also set up, and this is just a little bit of a sample of it, but I, I set up some conditional formatting rules so that they can be aware if a project item is waiting for dependency. So I have these the the roof and walls items changing color on the timeline to tell you that they aren't ready to start yet. They're waiting for something, um, which is especially useful for a project manager who might be looking at several different projects together in, intermingled in one calendar. They may be able to tell right away which of these are ready to go and which ones are waiting for something. Um, so kind of talk to you about how we built this. Um, I'm going to go back over to the ERD. Um, I built just a really simple task tracker. This is the sort of thing that's probably down in some of your apps already. If you have a tasks table and you have a projects table, but in, in the real world, you probably have a lot of other tables. Sorry to cut you off here, but real quick before you continue, can you please zoom in just a little oh, bit? Yeah. <laughs> just a little small in some places. Yep. That better? Uh, the window's really small now, but let's see if we can, yeah, make that big and then, yeah, that's better. Great. Thank you. Yep. All right. So, yeah, this is the sort of thing where this this cluster of tables probably already exists down in your app somewhere. But the main thing I've done that's different is I've added this prerequisites table. And uh, the, the thing to notice is that uh, you see a little bit of garbled text in here, and that's because there are actually two relationships from the prerequisites table up to the task table. This is a trick we usually use to join two tables together for a multi-select where you have a one child table that has two different parents and each entry in that child table represents one join of those two parents. And that way you can have a many to many relationships stored in that join table. What we're doing here though is there are two relationships. One is for the task in question and the other one is for the prerequisite of the task in question. And that means that it's basically a join table with itself. It's a many to many relationship with its own table so that each task can depend on multiple other tasks and for each other task that that task depends on there'll be one record down in the prerequisites table so if we go into the tasks table i can show you how this is set up so the the table itself is you know, pretty simple. I've just given each task a name, given some notes fields for the users to put a little extra information about what's going on, and an estimated start date, and uh, an estimated number of days in length. That way, if you needed to you know, adjust it during the on the fly, you say, all right, well, our estimated date was going to be this date, and we, we estimated it was going to start at seven days, but it ended up being 10. You can just change it here. There are about a million ways to configure this, um, but the, the you get the gist of it. We have we have an actual start and actual completion so that the users can come back to it later and say, all right, well, that's when we estimated it. This is when we actually did it. And then uh, we have finally we get to the real meat of it. This is the presumed start date. And the presumed start date is this is where we're trying to figure out when we think the start date will be based on everything else that they've told us. So we have the estimated start date and the actual start date. Those are nice concrete dates. So we're going to use the coalesce function. What the coalesce function does is it fills in the first thing it gets to that isn't null out of whatever is in that function. So you can put any number of commas and any number of fields between them or any number of functions between them. And it just goes with the first one that isn't null. So in this case, we're starting with the actual start because if they've put it in, we wanna just use that. If they haven't put in an actual start date, then it needs to fall back to figuring out what's the what's the latest date among all those prerequisites. If this if this task depends on a lot of other tasks, what's the latest date that one of those tasks is finishing? And we're doing that with the max function. We're reaching down into that prerequisites table and we're saying, what's the latest of all those clear dates? And I'll show you how we built that in a sec. Then if there is if there aren't any prerequisites, if they haven't set any up, or maybe the task just doesn't depend on anything else, then it falls back finally to that estimated start date. And it just uses that if there's nothing else. And if none of them are there, then it's blank. But what I've done is I, I set the estimated start 
to require it on the field level, on an inform level. So uh, no matter what, it, it should be there once they create this task. Then the presumed completion, basically the same formula. The only difference is that instead of that middle section where we said, the, what's the maximum cleared date? We're saying, well, what's the maximum cleared date plus the task length? Because we want this to be, if, if the task length is three days, then we want it to be three days after the, the cleared date is when we expect it to be completed. And then same thing with the, uh, uh, the actual date. If the actual date is there, then add those days to it as well. Um, but we're, we're basically doing the same formula, just with a little bit of extra handling to cover the fact that there might be several different dates at play. There's the scenario where maybe they put in the actual start date, but they haven't put in the actual completion date. We have to handle all those little calculations, um, but it's basically the same formula in these two. Uh, then finally, we have a calendar start, which is just converting that triggered text back into a calculated date field. Since we're going to use it in a, cal in a calendar, we can't use text for that. The triggered fields can only generate text. So we're converting that text from the triggered field back into a date field using this. Same thing with the completion. And then finally, if you use the Gantt, if you use the true Gantt function, um, Gantt goes point by point. Instead of, instead of using days as a range, it creates days as a point. And that's uh, you know, the pretty traditional with Gantt is that a, a day on that calendar represents a point rather than a range. But unfortunately, it means that if we use the same dates in both a calendar and a Gantt, the Gantt one will end up with some gaps. You'll have it finishing on one day with the next task starting on the next day. But because days are points instead of ranges, you'll have an empty space in between them. So to, so to solve it, I make a calendar start for Gantt where I just subtract one day from the regular start date. So if I'm using it on a calendar, I just use the presumed start. And if I'm using it on a Gantt, it's presumed start minus one day. Uh, and this makes those, uh, this makes those point-based days stitch up perfectly. And then and finally, that's I have more a couple... an optional, optional thing to do, right, Tim? Like you could have the Gantt based on the other ones, yeah. Oh, absolutely, yeah. It would, you, you would just get, you'd end up with those little gaps. It would make it look like there was a day skipped between two tasks, when in reality, there's not. Um, and effectively, what we're saying here is that the when you're designing this, think about it more like on the Gantt chart, I'm actually setting it so that the start date is the end of the night on the day before rather than the next morning. And that makes those items touch each other. So then down here, the status and uncleared prerequisites, I've made some extra calculated fields. Um, the purpose of these is just to help out with our conditional formatting and anything else you want to show the users. You can probably come up with a hundred of these for any scenario you're working on. Uh, but for this one, I, I just wanted to give, I wanted to make it so that each status could look down and figure out what, what was going on with itself so that we can have a nice friendly text string to show us what's going on with that task. Is it complete? Is it started? Is it waiting for dependencies? And that's also allowed me to do that conditional formatting because you can say if the status equals waiting for dependencies, then make it show up orange so that we know that. Uh, and then same thing down here. I'm just doing a sum of how many uncleared prerequisites are down in that table real simple formula but it means that i can say if this is more than zero then there's a prerequisite down there so then to jump back over to the rd again uh, we're going to head down to the prerequisites table next the prerequisites table is a little bit simpler because again this is just a plain table with two relationships in it there's only a little bit of business that we have to do down here um, one is I pull down the prerequisite using a calculated text field. This will let me make that prerequisite show up with the name of the pre with the name of the item that's dependent that it's uh, that the dependency is based on. That way we can say um, we can show it to people without showing them the relationship field directly. Uh, I also have a clear date. This is a regular date. We're not using any kind of formula here. We're not using a calculated field or a triggered field. We're using a script to fill this. Uh, and part of the reason for this is that if you are opening up one of these calendars, because of the way calculated fields work, uh, a calculated field has to run at the same time that you open the view. As soon as you open the view, that's when it's running. But what that means is that if you have a calculated field that says, all right, go look at my, go look at my dependent task and then find out if it's dependent on anything else. And then that task is going and looking at those. And that task is going and looking at those. I mean, you open up that calendar and the calculated fields will take a really long time to load because they're each, they're depending on each other in a chain and it'll have to run a whole lot. Uh, so what we're doing here is we're basically front loading that work and making it so that each time somebody saves one of these tasks, a script runs and goes and stamps that clear date down here. And that means that we're keeping the load off of the, the view. We're keeping the load off of the calculated view and doing it, uh, doing all that work when we save the record instead. 
this will keep the performance really snappy on those calendar views so that when people open them, they'll just open right away. You know, it doesn't have to think for very long. Um, and I'll, I'll show you that script in a moment. And then, uh, you know, finally, I'm pulling down that status, that field I already showed you for the uh, for the conditional formatting. I'm pulling it down here so that we can display it in nice little views and filters if somebody wanted to look at a list of dependencies. And then this is the field that we're rolling up to do the uh, to figure out how many unclear dependencies. All this is saying is, if this task, if the if the task that we're dependent on hasn't had an actual completion date set yet, that means it's not done yet. So we know that this one is isn't done yet. Uh, so we're just using that to make this show a one or a zero. And that way up at the parent level, we can add up those ones and zeros to figure out how many prerequisites are down there uncleared. Uh, so to head back, uh, let's go back up to the tasks table again. So the, the first Tim, thing- before we look at- Sure. Yeah, I was just gonna say we've got a question. Um, before we jump into the app scripts, um we've got a question from andrew um about the presumed start and the calendar start fields um so is there any reason why we need two fields or what is the reason that we need two fields instead of uh combining those two fields into one field so the this is again for performance i could I could put this whole formula straight into that calendar start field, but what it would mean is that this formula would have to run every time somebody opens the calendar. So if there's 10 tasks on there, all 10 of those tasks are gonna have to reach down and add up all the clear dates down on the child table. So to take just a little bit more performance off, this triggered field means that this will store each time somebody saves the task, and then it just gets handed over to the calculated date where this part is actually gonna run really fast. If the calculated field is just looking at the triggered field that's a couple milliseconds easy stuff but if it's um if it's doing the heavy lifting in a triggered field it'll mean it means it'll be out of the way before somebody is working on the calendar now you can run into some problems with um time zones using this method if um if you if you try this out and you get some tasks that are showing up an hour or two off it's possible for that to be caused by some time zone map um but it, it typically is isn't gonna happen because the user who is doing the change, the user who's going in and saying, I finished this task, they're saving it and it's in their time zone. So it'll get corrected for the viewer. When somebody loads the record, this uh, this calculated data is gonna receive the time zone from the person who saved it and then uh, translate it to the viewer's time zone. Uh, so you should be covered there, but, the, but basically that's the gist of it is we're just trying to gain a little bit of that performance by putting uh, some of that work back on the trigger text instead of the calc text. But, if you know that you aren't going to have that many tasks in here, if your operations are fairly simple, you could probably get away with just putting it all in the calculated field because we still have that script over on the other side stamping that date, and that's doing a lot of work for us. Yeah, so Andrew, you know, it's we typically say best practice to use triggered fields where you can, especially when you have child aggregate functions in your formulas. And in that case, we do. Um, so that's why it's uh, it's good to use the triggered field to do that so you don't run into performance issues in the long run. Yep. Great. So in the script itself, this is the one that runs on the task. So this is saying each time somebody has, each time the presumed completion changes, and this is one of the big advantages to using that triggered field is I'm able to say if the current values for presumed completion don't equal the previous values of presumed completion. So I'm saying whenever that field changes, but a script can't look at a calculated field. So if I were if I were using this presumed completion field as that triggered text field, if I were using a calculated field there, then I would have to write that formula into the script also. And that's pretty doable, but it, it would be a little bit extra work. So instead of saying, if current values of presumed completion don't equal previous values of presumed completion, I'd have to say, if the actual completion date isn't present and the estimated completion date is present and the estimated completion date doesn't equal the current actual completed date and so on and so forth. And I had to write a lot, of, a lot of little wrinkles into that if statement to make that work. I find that the trigger field really saves us a step because the, the trigger field has already done the work and the script can just look straight at it. Um, and in this case, the trigger field changing will cause the script to run. So we're saying um, if that trigger field has changed, then go down into the prerequisite joins. I'm just doing a list map with get children. So I'm reaching down into that table and saying, find me all of the records down there that belong to this record. And then for each of them, set their clear date 
to my clear date, to this task's clear date. So that way, each time somebody changes something, um, then it's just going to go down into those programs and change them. One thing I will note is that when you do these get children, it's going to ask you for a specific relationship. And you have to make sure that on this, in this case, you're using the prerequisite relationship, not the active task relationship. Um, and how, how we're handling that is that you know, we're using those two different relationships in different places so that one is always looking down and one is always looking up. And that's how we're able to get them to uh, talk to each other down in a line where each of those each of those tasks depends on others, but those others might depend on others still. By using those one one relationship for each direction, we're able to make nice little W patterns that, uh, that flow that information up and down. And then similarly, uh, if we go over to the, if we go back to the prerequisites table, I've got a, a basically the same script just written from the other side over here, because uh, when those get, when those initial items get created, they need to get an initial value. That presumed completion date needs to get pulled down when those uh, join records get created. So here I'm saying, if the current values of the prerequisite task and the current, if, if there is a prerequisite task, and if the prerequisite task has a presumed completion date, which I'm just writing this part of the script to avoid errors. Um, if, if for some reason that parent task doesn't have a presumed completion date, maybe something has gone wrong with that triggered field, I would prefer if this script just didn't run instead of throwing an error and confusing the user. Uh, so if that's the case, then reach up to that parent value and get the presumed completion date and just stamp it straight into there for this record. And this is only running on insert, so it's just happening once right when the record gets created to make sure it gets that initial value. And then all changes after that should come from the script we just looked at. Uh, so the end result then is that uh, each time each time somebody makes a change to the tasks table, uh, to a record on the tasks table, to change a change that would cause that triggered field to update, that triggered field updating makes the script run. It reaches down to all the prerequisites. It leaves the date there, and then the triggered field from here looks down at that same date, but it looks at it over the other relationship. So the the task that is the task that other tasks are dependent on is reaching down and writing its own date into the child in the, into the child fields with the script, but then the task that is dependent on it is looking down with the triggered field to find the maximum of those dates. So it's just it's sometimes it's good to think about it as though it's uh, just kind of split it and think about it like it's two tables in your head, even though we've got them overlaid on each other. Uh, yeah, to get back over to the examples. Um, now, now we see all those tasks coming through again. So each time when I showed you before where I changed that prerequisite, what that means is that the prerequisite date, uh, even though we have an estimate date and an actual date, it's going to go by the date that we have uh, for, for what actually happened. Um, but if I, go, if I go in and I say, all right, here's, here's this task, here's when it should be, you know, the estimated clear date over here, which I've, I've done with these child views, I've pulled in all of those prerequisite tables to show you Foundation, uh, this task is dependent on foundation and roof is dependent on this task. We can see the estimated cleared date right down there, but if we know that eh, this is getting cleared on the 8th, but I'm not really starting this till the 11th, so I'm going to put in the actual start date. Now we go back here and it's locked in uh, with the gap. So it's going to put it, it's going to put it in where it was. Um, so then the, um, uh, even, oops, I put the wrong month, that's why. One second. All right, June 11th. Okay, so now we see that the uh, the foundation is there and the walls are there, but they started later. Um, and then if they put if they put their actual completion date in, then they're going to see uh, how long it ended up taking. So there are a couple different ways, you know, a couple different ways to do this. I've I've also seen versions of this where you need to have you know, if if we get past the estimated start date and the actual date hasn't been put in, we want the calendar date to keep updating and keep being today, where we just assume that each of the tasks starts today. You can do that too. It's that same field. You just put it into that um, the calculated start field that we're using for the calendar to say if if the estimated start is prior to today, then make it say today instead, so that they continue to drift into the future. There's about a million little little feature upgrades you could do like that that just sort of depend on you know, what your business is doing, what you're what you're trying to accomplish specifically. Um, but there's a, a lot of little wrinkles in here. Okay. 
So that's a that's a little bit complex, right? There's a lot of moving parts there. Um, so I'll give everyone a couple minutes here to uh, some time to just think about everything that they've seen. See if you have any questions. Um, okay, I think we might have one coming through here. All right, so Tim. Um, Samantha is asking if there's a way to have overlap in the tasks. Ah, yeah. Yeah, so there is a way. Um, this is the, the next level of this build is if, yeah, if you, in a lot of uh, project management, you'll have that, uh, this, is, this is doing start to finish. This is saying that the prerequisite task defines when the new task should start, where this one, the, the second task is going to start when the first task ends. What if you have one where they have to start at the same time or where this task doesn't really care when task one ends, but it cares, it needs to start about two days after task one starts. You can do that too. Um, and the way we do it is uh, on this view where you show this must be completed first, I'll actually go to one where it's a little bit more relevant, uh, the walls. So if, if walls, walls need foundation to be completed first, you can add a field to that child table that says something like style or like timing or something and give it a drop down that says finish to finish or start to start. And, uh, and then based on that drop down, have those have the field uh, handle it a little bit differently. You can say uh, when the script runs from the task table to reach down into the prerequisites and stamp that date, that same script could look at that drop down and say, if it says finish to finish, then stamp down this date. If it says finish to start, stamp down a different date. Uh, and then you can also put a, another field on that table where you say offset days. You can put a number field to say, how many days should it be offset by? You can either put negative two if it should be offset backwards or plus two if it should be offset forwards and have that same field, uh, have that same field down on that child table, just add or subtract that many days. And that way, when the trigger field runs, it, instead of getting the original clear date, it'll get that adjusted clear date and pull it back. So basically, if you if you want to have any kind of adjustment or start to start, you just have to insert it into one of these processes. Just kind of get in between, have the script do it or have the trigger field do it. Uh, just kind of get in the middle of that information flow and pass through an adjusted date instead of the original date. Gotcha. So just a little bit more complexity, another field, but yeah, that sounds doable, right? Okay, um, we've got a question from uh, Jason about multiple, uh, what, what if an item has multiple things that, it, uh, that, it, that it's dependent on, sorry. <laughs> yeah, so the, with multiple dependencies, if you are linking from one to one to multiple, it's the same, same thing here where you, you go to this dropdown, you just pick more than one in the dropdown. The prerequisite date uh, will always be based on whatever the highest is among those prerequisites. So if you get four different prerequisites in there, it'll always just tell you what's the latest date among all of them. The ones, if, if it's dependent on four tasks, the ones that finish earlier don't matter. It just cares about whatever's last right now. If those tasks move around so that a different one has the end date, has a different one has the maximum date, then it'll just keep updating that maximum date. However, um, there is, it does mean that that script has to work a little bit harder. So each time you, each time you save one of these, if a lot of tasks are dependent on your task, it'll be longer and longer as you save that task. And I, I've tested this up to a pretty, pretty high amount and it tends to run pretty well. But if you have long chains where each step in the chain, many of your tasks have a lot of different dependencies, um, we may have to increase the script timeout on your table. By default, scripts to have two seconds to run. And if it gets to the point where you're starting to see issues where it won't it won't save in that time, we can bump your uh, we can bump up the script timeout quite a bit. And for this, I think if you had a really complicated system where you have a lot of tasks, depending on a lot of tasks, go ahead and just call us and we'll we'll increase your script timeout for that. It's a good idea with this build. And what, what so that'll mean is that it, when that the timeout will only matter when somebody is saving a new task. So when somebody goes in and puts in that actual date or changes their estimates. If it has a lot of things dependent on it, then they click save, it may just have to think for a second while it's saving, but it'll only affect that person that's changing the dates. It won't affect everybody opening the calendar or any of the dependent tasks. Yeah, okay. So this, the way that this is set up now, and I just saw another question come in from Mike. Um, 
the way that this is set up now, <clears throat> it accounts for that, right, Tim? Like you could have the roof be dependent on both foundation and walls if you wanted. You just choose multiple things in that multi-select. Yep, exactly. Is that, yeah. Okay. Yeah, so it'll create, if I put walls and foundation, it'll put them both down here. It'll tell me when they're closing, but we see that walls are closing on 613. So that means that this task will start on 613 because it'll just go by the maximum of what it sees there. Okay. So I hope that um, answers. There is, there, yeah, there is another another thing worth mentioning here is that if if I pick uh, if I pick itself, if I pick this task where it is dependent on itself, um, it's, it's just going to think for a long time and then it'll say no. Uh, <laughs> so just... You know, make make sure your users know it's the the making it so that it doesn't show up in that drop down adds a lot of complexity to this. It's actually a lot easier to just leave it in there, and it, it really doesn't break anything. If somebody picks it accidentally, it'll think for a minute and it'll say, "Nope, sorry, can't do that." Um, but it, it won't otherwise uh, it won't otherwise damage your calendars or anything. Awesome. Um, <clears throat> okay, a couple more questions coming in here. Uh, from one from Tom um if it's possible to drag the um the entries of the tasks around from the gantt chart view unfortunately no uh, normally normally it would be but because we're relying on uh calculated fields since calculated fields are powering the dates they're they're basically pushed from the other side so we can't change them um, and also because of the extra complexity of you know, which date exactly should the user be changing, are they changing the estimated date or the actual date, this approach means that they'll have to open it up and give us something a little more specific before they move it. Okay. And I know, your, Tom, your question was about the Gantt chart specifically, but same also applies, right, uh, Tim, to the other views that you had? Yep. Yeah, they all work the same way, where if, if you have a date behind it, you can drag it and change that date. You could, uh, in this circumstance, if you had a like a master scheduler or something, you could have a view for that person that does go off of the estimated date. It wouldn't do the same sliding, but the person who's using that view would be able to drag it and change the estimates, which would in turn make it show up differently on somebody else's Gantt chart. So you might find some scenario where doing that is useful. Awesome. Uh, and then another Jason, uh, got a lot of Jasons here today. What um, what about the, Tim, if you could show us real quick how you created the Gantt chart. So just the settings on that view. Yeah, yeah so the, the true Gantt is a, it's just a chart. So it's over in, in the format tab and it's uh, this one right over here. Um, and this is true Gantt, gives you the options where you say, I've got it with the name, the name is the project name and the row label is the task name. You can make this anything. You could make it the owner, so it says who owns it is the lane. You could make it uh, the status. A lot of different ways to do it. Um, I, I find that it's often useful to have a different version of this for different people, where like maybe the project manager who oversees the whole operation sees it separated by project. But then if you have a view that's just for the foreman who only cares about one project, well, they're going to want to see it by owner. They're not going to care about projects. So like you, you'll end up building several versions of this once you make it. Um, and then here I've got, I'm using for the start date, I'm using that calendar start for Gantt. Uh, if I change it to just calendar start, the spacing is just a little bit different. It's, it's a subtle difference, but you will notice it. Um, and then the end date is that calendar completion. So the, the true Gantt is uh, by far the easiest one of these to build since it's just in the chart menu. Um, and then the, uh, the timeline view, the timeline view is built uh, when you open up a view over on this menu, it says timeline calendar down here, and it gives you some bigger menus to, to formulate those. Um, timeline and calendar, have a, they have a, a million little settings you can do. You can tell it what exactly should show up in the card and how should it look. That's a whole, a whole can of worms by itself, but, uh, but that's how you do that one. Awesome. <clears throat> I think I've also seen, you know, you're talking about grouping the or the rows in your Gantt chart, you know, um, maybe you have different milestones of the project and multiple tasks within a milestone. Those could also be your rows, right? Yeah, um, milestones are about. milestones are a really good row, uh, especially if you have a number, right? If you if you have a number, you can sort the milestones uh, in alphabetical order. So you have milestone one, milestone two, milestone three. You'll still get that nice waterfall where the tasks move down, uh, but you'll see them in chronological order for the project. <clears throat> okay, um, another question here from Mike about if you have a project plan uploaded with dependencies, 
Um, would you just use a script to create the prerequisite child records? So you would, the, yeah, you could create the child records with a script. I like the multi-select, especially just because it's really friendly for the users. But if you had a source for that data, like if you were importing it from a spreadsheet or something, you could put comma separated values showing it's dependent on task one, task two, and task seven. You could have the script look at those values and say, for each item in this list, go find that task, set a dependency to it. You could definitely do it with a script if you had a, if you had a good enough data source coming in. Um, that's the hardest thing is making sure you have something machine readable for the script to use. Mm -hmm. Yep. <clears throat> okay. Um, and then Jason, again, I think this is a follow on question about the Gantt chart, being able to drag uh, items around on a Gantt chart. Um, you In the calendar view and the timeline view, you can drag the entries around to the events or the tasks or whatever they are in, in, in your scenario. The Gantt chart, you cannot do that. You can't drag things around on the Gantt. Okay, that's a different, the, that view type, even if it was using a standard date field, you would not be able to drag those things around. Right? That's, that's timeline and calendar view type functionality. Um, and then, um, Tim, Mike would like uh, you to dive into uh, just in a little bit more detail um, why the Gantt and timeline require the date subtraction. So the, um, okay, so for the, the timeline view, if we say that this task starts on June 7th, then it will start it at the beginning of June 7th. And then if we say that this task starts on June 9th, it'll start at the beginning of June 9th, which means that if this task ends, if the end date of this task is June 11th, it will go through, because we should have, uh, it's the seventh task length is four days, which means that the estimated end date is the 11th. Um, that means that it will end through the 11th. The timeline view is uses through logic. So if you say the start date is the 7th, end date is the 11th, then it goes through the 11th. Because it's thinking, the, the timeline is designed to think about the day as a range of time. But then on the Gantt chart, uh, if you say this one is starting on uh, Tuesday the 6th, and it's ending on the 11th, it's actually going to go point to point. It, it thinks of that Tuesday, the 6th, as a, as a point on the range, and then it's thinking of the 11th as a point on that range. So it goes precisely between those two. And that means that if you say this one ends on the 11th, the next one starts on the 12th, then it'll have a gap between the two. Uh, so like if I, just to give you an example, see these walls and the roof, right now the, the walls finish on the 13th and the roof starts on the 13th because I've used that date. Um, but if we go into this and change it, to just use calendar start, uh, we see that in this case, the roof is actually starting on the 14th, which on the calendar makes sense. This one finishes on the 13th, this one starts on the 14th. They, they link right up with each other. But in reality, we don't, we don't think about it that way. We think about this one as starting at the beginning of the date, right? We want the walls to go all the way through the end of the 13th, and we want the roof to start at the same time that the other one finishes. Um, so it's just the, the design of the Gantt chart conceives of days as points and the design of the timeline and the calendar conceive of days as a range. Awesome, all really good questions. I think, I think that's all of them here. Uh, keep sending them through if you have more. Uh, we've got a couple more minutes here. So if you have more questions, let's, uh, let's get them in. Um, I'll see if I can get my screen share back here. Thank you so much for the demo, Tim. Um, there's a lot going on there. <laughs> uh, let's see. I think this should work. Share. Bear with me here. screen share okay there we go um awesome so we just talked a lot about questions um okay i think we have another question so let's just do it now um from tom could you use this formula or similar uh to simplify uh or not with the gantt chart got it okay so um tom you're asking if you could use weekdays of start and end uh, rather than the date diff 
function or date sub, I, I believe. Uh, what do you think about that, Tim? Yeah, I don't I don't know if I would use I don't know if you, I would use weekdays quite that way. Um, I would more go the other way around, where if you wanted to, for instance, if you wanted the user to be able to put in that number of days they think it'll take, but you want them to just be putting in number of weekdays it'll take, then it will need to look for the number of weekends between the two days and add extra pad days for that. So if it sees that they said it's going to take four weekdays, but today is within three days of Saturday, then we need to add two more days to the length on the calendar so that it will skip over those weekends and, and count, you know, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Monday. Um, so I actually do it the other way around where I'm, I'm trying to figure out how many weekends there are and for each weekend pad the item with two more days. <clears throat> awesome. Uh, more questions coming in. Love it. Uh, so if you use durations instead of end dates, um, which I believe is what we were doing or you were doing in this demo, Tim, where you say if this is X number of days, um, do the Gantt charts line up better than if you use a start and an end date? Yeah, unfortunately, Gantt still requires a start and an end date no matter what. So even if you're using durations, you still have to convert it back to an end date to feed into the Gantt. Uh, so we run into the same issue, um, but you can do it. You can't put that correction on either end. I, I've done it before. It just it depends on the business and how things tend to go. I usually ask a lot of questions about how exactly do your tasks work together and how long do they tend to take. But the um, if you know that the task is going to be, um, if you know the if it makes sense, sometimes you can put it where instead of subtracting from the start date, you're adding to the end date. Sometimes that works a little bit better and makes a little more mental sense. It just kind of depends on how your operation is. It also has, um, if you have a date, if you're using date and time fields, you can make it a little bit more granular where you're really showing like hour to hour where things are. And that, that alleviates a lot of the problem because if it's, a, if it's a small gap of an hour rather than a gap of an entire day, then that makes perfect sense to people when they look at your chart. Yep, true. Good point. Okay, so um, if you have questions, keep sending them through. We'll come back uh, and do more in a second if there are any. Um, let's talk about some key takeaways. Um, so overall, right, Gantt charts are a great way um, to visualize the events or the tasks that occur um, during your projects, right? You can see the overall picture as well as the more granular picture for each task. Um, you can create dependencies, right? Uh, between those tasks or events by adding that join table that Tim showed us, right? So I think, you know, most project management apps would have the project table that you showed, Tim, the tasks table, but then adding in that, that, that third table or the second one after the tasks is functioning almost like a join and that's needed to say, you know, task A is dependent on task B and so forth, okay? in a scalable way is the key there. Yeah, uh, and if, then you saw Tim, go ahead, Tim. Yeah, if, if you were doing like, it basically it gives us that many to many. It gives us the ability to link them uh, so that you have more than one dependency. If you did a like a self join to the table, you'd only be able to have, each task would only be able to have exactly one parent and one child. By doing it with a join like this, it, it opens it up and we can have any number of dependencies for any number of tasks. Um, cool. And then what you saw was uh, Tim Tim walked us through uh, the two tables, right? And those tables had a combination of calculated fields, triggered fields, app scripts, right? There was there was a lot going on there. Um, you could potentially simplify uh, what we saw today by just using calculated fields. Um, however, like we talked about, doing that is probably not going to be the best option in the long term, right? When you start actually using the app, populating it with information, and you have a lot of tasks, a lot of dependencies, you're probably going to run into some performance um, degradation, right? If you take that route, right? But using triggered fields and app scripts in combination with the calculated fields would ensure that you don't run into those things. Right, so you want to be careful about the way that you're constructing it, and the way that we saw today is a really good way to do that. Okay. Anything else to add there, Tim? Nope. Nope. All right. 
Just make sure we don't have any more questions here. I don't think there are any. And if we missed yours, we'll just go back through and make sure we got them all and follow up with you after the webinar. Um, all right, so just to wrap things up here, um, that's, you know, we looked at a lot of things today, right? We saw dashboards, we saw a couple of different types of views, calculated fields, triggered fields, app scripts. We even saw, you know, multi-select widgets um, on the form that Tim was using to select the prerequisites. We saw, um, even, I think Tim, something you might not have mentioned was there were some dependent dropdowns also set up on that uh, multi-select widget, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, ah, yeah, um, yeah. So for the for the multi-select, you have to. I, I have it set up so that it only shows items that share a project with the current item. So if you don't want people to be able to crisscross and have a task dependent on a task from a different project, uh, I just put a little dependent dropdown in there to say only show me items in this multi-select if they share a parent with the current task's parent. Uh, right. So, you know, bottom line there is there's there's a lot of topics there to cover, right? Um, so if you're interested in, in learning more about those topics, we of course have all the, you know, Track for University on demand courses for you to look at, um, as well as the knowledge base articles. So go check those things out. Um, if you have questions um, about uh, anything you saw here, or if you're trying to set this up in your own account and you just have questions, you know, you always have the ability to contact uh, Track via support. Um, and if you'd like a little bit more assistance, you know, perhaps somebody to help set this up for you, build it in your own uh, account uh, for you, then, you know, we all we always have those professional services, uh, you know, uh, of which Tim is a member of our implementation team uh, to help you build out those more complex things if you'd like. Um, and then just some final notes. Um, I got to throw this out there, but um, May is almost over. And I think a lot of you may have seen and maybe already taken advantage of uh, the fact that we are giving away free admin certification submissions uh, through the month of May. So there's really just two days left. Um, every uh, admin on the TrackVIA uh, platform, all of our customers can use um, a free certification submission. Um, we you know, highly recommend taking advantage of it. It only takes an hour to do the exams and there's a lot of benefits uh, to being admin certified. You get, you know, um, free uh, you know, services with the professional services team. Um, you get uh, free enrollment in some tutoring groups, right? There's a lot of different things that you get. So go to the Track the University website, check it out um, and take advantage of it. There's two days left. Um, and then when you sign off for this webinar, there'll be a short survey. If you could fill it out, we'd really appreciate that. It helps us improve the, the webinars. Um, and then we're gonna post this recording on the Track the University website. So, um, I think we have another question here. So uh, if you're still on, feel free to stick around. Um, but uh, if you want to drop, uh, go ahead, feel free. Thanks for joining. Uh, we appreciate it. Um, all right, so let's see, last question here from Mike. Um, how many tasks have you been able to run in two seconds, assuming a moderate number of parallel tasks tim <laughs> yeah so i i have tested the chain out to 30 uh and that obviously it, there's a slight difference between where exactly in the layer they show up but it's probably on the millisecond level but i've tested it with chains involving 30 tasks and it seemed to work okay my suspicion is that if all 30 were in a very long chain as in one task depending on one task depending on one task depending on one task that probably runs worse because it involves the the triggered field running at each one of those steps, where if it spreads out from the top and goes wide, it's a little bit more efficient because the triggered fields are running fewer times. But those those vagaries are probably in like the, the 16th of a second range. Um, but yeah, it looked like 30, 30 was pretty safe. Um, I didn't hit, I didn't start hitting the limit until I got really complicated with it. But it also depends on how how big the table is, how much stuff it's having to look at, or if you've involved any other details. Um, but yeah, 30 seemed like it was working pretty smoothly most of the time. Great. Yeah, and I'll I'll double down on the really depends on what else you've got going on, right? Um, if you have a lot of other app scripts and other triggered fields that maybe not necessarily related to this dependency, but that also have to run for some reason, you know, of course it'll it'll differ. Yeah. Okay. Great. Thank you, everyone, for uh, joining us today. Um, we're about at the top of the hour anyway. Um, we'll post this webinar for you to, to look at uh, after the fact, and we'll see you next time.